Uh, Digital technology is something that Spark are extremely passionate about, obviously, and, and, and Spark believe firmly that companies that embrace digital technology in the right way um, perform better, grow uh, more quickly, um, and achieve their goals much faster. Um, and I guess the Spark Labs is one way that Spark are helping to hopefully help a few businesses to, to achieve their potential through gaining some knowledge, some inspiration and some connections as well. So please, I hope you enjoy uh, today. Uh, feel free to provide feedback. We, we really want as much feedback as possible. We really want as many questions as possible as well. So without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Sir Ray Avery, um, who, who really, I'm sure everyone knows him, him very well, um, one of the great uh, New Zealanders really, and one of New Zealand's great innovators. Uh, Sir Ray came to New Zealand in 1973 um, and has held positions with uh, Douglas Pharmaceuticals, um, the Fred Hollows Foundation, is now Chief Executive and Founder of Medicine Mondial, and there's some amazing um, stories of innovation and things that we're going to hear today. Uh, Sir Ray was uh, New Zealander of the Year, 2010. Uh, Reader's Digest Most Trusted Person in New Zealand, it was a pretty good accolade, 2011, and I'm going to have to read this out, but you're a, a, a Knight of the Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit, have I got that right? Yeah, that's quite a mouthful, it's certainly quite a title. So, um, so we're very lucky, and uh, could you please join me in, in welcoming Sir Ray to Wellington. So, so Ray, um, we're all here to talk about business innovation, the business innovation series, and, uh, and your, your, your topic is about dreaming big and doing bigger, which is a theme that you hear a lot from, from innovators and companies that are innovative, and, and last night we talked with Google who were talking about, um, don't worry about 10% improvement, worry about 10 times improvement, and, and which is, I guess, a different way of expressing the same thing. What's your, what's your view on, on, the kind of, on setting goals and ambitions? Well, I, I think fundamentally, um it, it's, it's not just even about innovation, it's about us, um, about how you deal with your life. Um, one of the things that makes us really peculiar as a species is that we, uh, we, when we start businesses, we, we, we form those businesses, we invest a lot of time and money, and if you're really smart, what you do um, to make that business successful is that you plan the exit strategy right at the beginning of the company, okay? Because that, that will govern what the company actually looks like. So if you're going to do... Uh, a company that's going to be, have an IPO, then you may not be particularly interested in setting up a marketing division and getting all the marketing things together so much as building IP in the company. So you actually plan things, you actually plan what you're going to do. Uh, but for the rest of our lives, we're really hopeless, we're Muppets when it comes to planning our own, own personal life. I know that I've got about 4,725 days left to live and I actually know what I'm going to do with them. You guys got no idea, do you? No, no. <laughs> What happens is that you were born with 30,000 days, that's it. People that are successful have a plan. You need to have a plan. It doesn't matter what that plan is, but if you have a three-year plan, um, that's your intermediate plan. But what you need to do is have a big, uh, a hairy, audacious plan and, and plan for something that you really dream that you could achieve in 10 years. And if you set that, you'll be much more successful than all your contemporaries because they haven't got a plan. They just are living their life in a whole series of extemporaneous relationships. What will happen is they go to a conference in Dunedin, meet a girl or a guy in a bar in Dunedin, before you know it, you're living in Dunedin, you know. Um, so. <laughs> so, but if you've got a plan, you make sure that everything fits in line with that plan and you will be more successful. So you start thinking about your plan. What's about, if you want to be sailing around the South Pacific when you're 55, you need to plan for it now. So by having a plan, you set objectives, and just by the fact that you have objectives mean that you're going to be more successful in the contemporaries. So that's a personal thing that you need to do. And it's also very relevant if you want to set up a company, because if you're going to be the leader of that company, if you have no idea what you really want to do, then you're not going to be able to transpose those ideas and that ideology to the people that work for you. So you need to know what you want to achieve. On the back of our business cards for Medicine Mondial, we just have the words, change the world. And everybody in our company 200 people, mostly who work for us for nothing, believe that they can change the world because we have changed the world for many people and we will continue to do that and we actually all believe it. So getting that belief means you've got to start it yourself. You know, if, if you're broken and you don't know what you're doing with your life, then you're not going to be a successful entrepreneur. So you've got to get that bit right. And then what you've got to do is find a whole group of people who believe in your ideology and your dream and bring them together. What I know is that there's not one person in this room who's as clever as all of us. And that's why you need to actually start talking to each other. Because it's often people who have a dream or a plan and they go to a conference, meet somebody and they say, he can actually dovetail into that bit that I've got missing, that I actually need somebody to do that.
because you've got a plan, you know what you're looking for, and you talk to those people. And by doing that, you actually get the power of us, and that's a phenomenal thing. You know, there's so much... New Zealand's very good at that. We're very good at that landscaping and, and data mining. Unlike a lot of companies and organisations overseas, uh, we don't necessarily require an NDA before we start talking to people. We'll talk to somebody in the bar, and before you know it, you've got a, a joint venture going. So that's the kind of important stuff about... Um, but how do you foretell the future? Well, because um, that's what it's about, these big, hairy, audacious dreams. Um, we can't predict the future accurately. You can't connect the dots going forwards. But the best thing you can do is to do an algorithm and connect the dots backwards and see what's happened and then make some sort of real good um, theoretical guesses about what might happen. So going back in history, you can see all those fatal mistakes that people made because they didn't understand the wave of technology that was coming you know, before them. So a good example was um, AT&T in the 1980s got McKinsey to do a, a business study on whether they should go into mobile phone technology. And McKinsey said, no, the mobile phones are far too bulky and uh, they've, they've got limited um, coverage, so don't bother with that, that's not going to work. And of course we all know that technology made that change. So instead of walking around with... I remember being in Nepal in the early 80s and I was up at the top of a mountain um, talking with my wife-to-be with a, a cell phone the size of a brick and I had to climb up the top of this tree to actually contact her and she was in uh, Melbourne uh, sitting in a cafe talking to me and I was hanging on to this tree for dear life and she was just talking about the dress she just bought and I was nearly dying but I, <laughs> I thought I can't tell her, you know. <laughs> but um, So you've got to try and think about that technology in terms of... Um, where will we go? Uh, what I've learned is that um, often people get an idea for a product and they, that's the first thing that happens, they have a light bulb moment and then they start developing that product and right at the end of that process they start to try and market that product. And if you do that you'll have a Kodak moment. You know, Kodak went bust because they were absolutely product centric and not customer centric. So the first thing in your business plan is to actually determine your customer statement of need. That's the most important thing about any startup or any innovation. Because many people develop technologies and products for which there's no real customer. They love the fact that they think there's a customer. And I've seen them all. I've seen them all coming through my office. There, and they get so myopic about, they're so passionate about their, their product. A guy came to me once and he had a, he said, this is the biggest vacuum cleaner in the world, the most powerful vacuum cleaner. It's a guy from um, Unitech. And it was the size of a small spaceship, and you put it on your back. And he said, this can suck up a four-litre can of Coke. And I said, well, who's the customer? And he said, Eden Park. Eden Park, because there's a lot of rubbish that's over, you know, and, he, and he'd go up the aisles. And I said, well, he can't fit up the aisles. This size is the size of a small brick shithouse. I said, you can't get it up there. He said, I'll get an extension. And I call all these things, I'll get an extension, because they always get an extension to make it work. But, but really, you're trying to sell a product that nobody really wants. Whereas if you actually get a customer statement of need defined, and you don't have to be clever at it, you don't have to be somebody who uh, is practised in the art to invent something that's a real innovation. Because the way that innovation always occurs, and the ones that are really important, are just from the simple power of observation. Every single invention that you can ever think of is really somebody just observing something that's there for everybody to see, but they see it and they act on it. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Once there was a guy... He was in the Swiss Alps, he was hunting with his dog. His dog came back to him, it was covered in all these little cockle burrs, these little seeds, and they really were stuck on quite tough. They were also on the bottom of his trousers. So he got home, looked at them under the, his kid's microscope, and he could see all these little burrs, all like little hooks like that. And he invented Velcro. Just that one moment of observation. Another guy was fishing in, uh, with the Indian Indians, they were showing him how to fish, he was an engineer. And he pulled out this fish and immediately it got into the minus 4 to 40 degree temperature uh, chill factor. It froze, solid as a rock, hopeless. So he threw it on the back of the ute and forgot about it. Three months later when the fall came, it started to melt. So he thought, I wonder if it's any good. And he went inside, cooked it, and it was perfect. His name was Mr Bird's Eye, and he invented Bird's Eye Foods for flash freezing food, which changed the way that we actually delivered food. But the important part of this story is um, he, he had a technology and he focused on the product. And what happened was he started a company called Bird's Eye Foods to provide you with frozen food packages. And he went bankrupt. Because at that time, nobody had refrigerators. When he started the company, 15 years later, refrigerators had started to be deployed and he made a fortune. 
So sometimes people talk about timing for timing being the critical thing for starting your business. I mean, obviously, if you start a business and uh, the timing's wrong, you'll go bankrupt. But I, I think that's probably the outfall of not having the right customer statement of need. If you've got the right customer statement of need, you actually mitigate all of that because you know that there's no people with refrigerators. You actually go through that whole process and say, who's the customer? And there were three guys, a good example of how simple it can be, is three guys were trotted out of their mind in Paris, came out of the pub, and they, they had three problems. And they were three customer-centric problems. They didn't know where they were exactly. They didn't have any money to pay for a cab. And they didn't know the number of a local cab company. So they invented Uber because that actually solved all of those problems for those customers. But they had a big, hairy, audacious, audacious goal, and that was simply to go global day one, because they knew that the mobile phone could do that for them. So seeing that opportunity, and we're not very good at that, you know, unfortunately, you've had all of that educated out of you. And that's the big problem we have for the future, is that we're going into a world that's going to be really, really quite different in the next 50 years. And the kids that we're educating are being educated on a system that was predicated by the Industrial Revolution. You know, you're all a product of that, um, where our no curriculum anywhere in the world is creativity and innovation. It's always, you know, the top ones are maths, you know, uh, literature, blah, blah, blah. And so when you go to preschool, you can open all the drawers and play to your heart's content, you know, pull teddy bears out and set fire to them, as I did. Um, but, but, you know, well, you do what you like. But when you go to proper school, you have to get unified. You're, you're put in a uniform, and all of the creativity that you've got is actually distilled out of you. And what worse than that, we actually, the metric that we actually imposed, which was to see how you were going and maybe improve your education, has become <coughs> not a metric, but a, a pass-fail goal. So we educate our kids to get NZCE, and then we make them a certain size, fitting in a certain size letterbox, and we call that successful education. Einstein said, if you want to make your children innovative, then read them fairy stories. Because what he was really saying was, having knowledge is one thing, but how you, how you have the vision and the um, wisdom and, the, and the, the, the adventurousness of thinking about how you might deploy that is what makes things different. And so you've got to kind of retrain yourselves. And in companies, you need to create that environment. You know, everybody that works for, for us has a lot of fun because they're human. You know, you spend more working hours with the people that you actually work with than any other group of people in the whole world. And yet, in big companies, you dilute that power of us by dividing them up into little quadrants. So you have production, quality assurance, and accounts. Production and quality assurance are natural enemies, and of course everybody hates accounts, you know. Um, so you break these things up, and they don't work holistically. But if you can make them work holistically, uh, and see uh, that they are in fact a team working for the same objectives, then you've got a very powerful group of people who can actually do anything. So you've got to create, try and create that, um, that infrastructure where uh, people feel that they know where they are and what they're doing in the company, and that they have fun. Um, if you look at creative companies like most advertising companies um, around the world or Google, there's not a desk in sight. There's beanbags, there's dart games, there's pinball machines. I'm not suggesting that if you're at the local hospital and somebody's going to do open heart surgery on you that there should be all of that stuff lying around. Um, but, but creating a, certainly a team environment, you can do it within the framework. My background is in pharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, medical devices, and um, that's about as stringent as you get in terms of regulations. But we would allow people to express themselves personally, and we would get the production people and the quality assurance people all to have lunch together. And we'd encourage them to do games together like uh, indoor football or, or darts or whatever, and that made them human. So they understood each other. Once you, people start seeing each other as human beings, they're no longer the guy from accounts. They're actually just somebody that they work with that they think is really cool, and he's better at cricket than they are. You know. So that's the, some of the things that we need to think about in terms of companies, you know. What, what else have you seen work well in terms of building a culture of innovation within businesses or how you've done it yourself? You talk about creating shared experiences and encouraging fun. What about encouraging failure? You hear that a lot in innovative companies. Is that something, it's quite, probably quite hard to encourage failure in a, in a sort of... Well, failure is, a, failure is um, uh, predicated on, on fear, really. Um, and fear is just a mad notion. I mean, I'm lucky because I, I, I was brought up in the UK in orphanages and the first 14 years and pretty much everything bad that could happen to a human being happened to me. But I survived it. So what that gave me was the gift of not being frightened. 
I'm, I'm pretty much fearless, really, quite frankly. Um, and it gives me an edge because if a bear's coming towards me in the, in the, in the uh, my wife doesn't believe this. We've yet to prove this, but, um, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but if a bear's coming towards me in the bush, and um, I, I have this logic of, you know, the way I live my life is really like a Buddhist uh, monk in the sense that, uh, except for the sex bit. Um, but um, what, what I, what I do is I. Um, I, great happiness and great sadness are both imposters, okay? You know, so I don't get really sad or really happy. I know that they're all, it's, it's all going to, tomorrow, if I'm really happy today, it'll be really shitty tomorrow for some reason, something's gone wrong. Um, so I just have this, I just watch it all go by. And the same thing happens with fear. So if this big bear is coming to eat me, and most of the people will be galvanised by fear because they've got a flight reflex. And so they're either going to be stand most and get eaten, or they're going to run away and get eaten. So your best chance is to go out and snot the bear, you know, and snot him and, and, or hit him in the nuts or something. But, um, so, so I think about fear like that. So I'm not worried about fear. I think about the structure of why. Fear is about the fear of something that might happen. So some people just don't start businesses because they might fail. And failure itself um, for successful people is just a cul-de-sac on the way to success. Because it's, it's a learning process. If you learn from it, you, in fact, some startup company investors in the US, particularly, and Israel, they won't invest in a startup unless at least one member of that organisation has failed in a business before, because it's going to happen. It will not, you will not go through your whole business life without having some failure. Well, all you can do is try and mitigate that failure and, and think about how do for what we call failure mode cause risk analysis. That's just what, every little detail that could go wrong, and that's why I didn't get married till I was 60. But I've got a lot of due diligence. Um, <laughs> but you can plan for, um, for fa to, to, to mitigate failure. The failure is just a learning process. And if you looked at a rugby game um, and people are watching what happens, you can actually see um, where, where that, those passes went wrong and what somebody did that was wrong. And you can actually protect yourself from doing that the next time round. So, so you look at failures as just a learning process. They're not the end of the, uh, end of the line. But in terms of um, an, another way of um, understanding how you build those companies, when I first joined um, Douglas Pharmaceuticals and we were setting up Douglas Pharmaceuticals, um, I started to understand how important teams were uh, in terms of... There were five or six uh, multinational drug companies making drugs in New Zealand at that time, Smith, Claim, Beach and Glaxo. And we were a start-up company. We had about three products when we started. And um, over the next seven years, we developed about 350 different pharmaceutical uh, products. And today, there are no multinational drug companies making drugs in New Zealand. And uh, New, uh, Douglas Pharmaceuticals does all the manufacturing for those companies that do manufacture locally. So we contract manufacture for them. And how did that small generic company overwhelm the might of multinationals? Well, they decided we had two things going for us. One is they were product centric. They went out trying to sell products. And we were absolutely customer centric. Because the reality was, and this is how profound it is, if you've got a generic drug and a multinational drug, they're identical. Okay? They have to be identical, and the FDA says they have to be absorbed at the same rate and all of that. So the difference was that they had all this slash packaging, and their product was slightly more expensive, and we had this... We didn't actually have a, a, a product catalogue. We had a price list. And they went around saying to their pharmacists, look, you can't trust this Douglas stuff, and you still see this on the television about you know, alternative medicines where the multinationals still promote the product and say, um, you should buy this one because it's established and well-proven and trusted. Anyway, uh, we never tried to do that. We went to the pharmacist and said, what do you want? And they said, we want to build our businesses. Can you help us build our businesses? We would like to have one month's interest-free credit when you supply us with stock, and can we have bonus stock? So if you bought 10, we would give them one for free. We thought that was brilliant because we could get more of our product on the shelves. And over the next 10 years, we overwhelmed all the multinationals because we were customer-centric. We never tried to sell a product. We worked with our customers. So find out what your customers want. Get every single detail about their customer statement of need, and if you fulfill that, you'll have a successful business. So don't try and sell products. So we learned that. But the other thing that made us really 
we, we came up with campaign manufacturing where we had one room which we could put a whole different lot of um, production equipment in to make whatever product you like and then put all this equipment back into different rooms and make another product versus the old uh, 1940s method of making products which is have little rooms set aside just like your offices. When you think about it, you're all siloed in little offices and little rooms but ones that are open, more open plan are more dynamic and people talk to each other. Same with manufacturing. You can do campaign manufacturing, do it much more efficiently. But what we, the other thing was the, 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 the staff. I realised that our biggest asset, you know, in, in any business, you have to understand every single customer in your business. And unfortunately, most people think that that customer base starts outside the business. It actually doesn't. It starts right back, firstly, at home. Because the most important customer in your life is your person you go to bed with every night. Because if that isn't right, you can't function. You know, if you're going through a divorce or something's happening, then you're not going to work particularly well. So you've got to get that right. The next one, the most important customers are the people that you work with. Your staff, they're the most important customer in your business because they will stay with you if you get that right through thick and thin. So the way that we would do that and get them to start working as a team was if you Douglas, uh, uh, started at Douglas, there'd be a big board table. You would join and sit at the end and I'd say, welcome to Douglas Pharmaceuticals, Technical Division. I'm Dad and your job is to look after me. And you're all my children and, and your job is to look after me. And all of you, your job is to look after each other. And if one of you starts to show off and show how clever you are, everybody else in the room is going to put their hand up and whistle like Superman because you think you're Superman. You're not Superman, but we are. And so we built this unassailable team. So these guys were working uh, probably seven days a week. The guys would go out and get trolled at, at, uh, on Friday nights down the pub. But one by one, they'd come back to this really open plan research and development laboratory where there were couches and they could get somebody cooking some food for them and they would work, they'd start working. And that's how we managed in 10 years to produce 360 products because we had a team that believed that they could. Every time we won a formula, everybody would do a conga dance through the whole factory. But, uh, <laughs> because we actually believed in ourselves. And those band of brothers have followed me through um, all the work that I've done in developing countries. I'll show you how profound that is. Uh, but I should say, what we also lack is understanding who we are as a country. We are quite different from the rest of the world. But you don't know it because you, when immigrants see what New Zealand is, when they first come to a country, they, they, they're more likely to see things that we miss. We take everything for granted. If I picked you up and took you to a, my favourite tapas restaurant in Spain and told you you had to find your way back to the hotel, you'd be stopping on every street corner looking at those signs. You'd be observ observant and knowing where you are. But when you're in your everyday life, you don't do that. Once you know where the dairy is, you switch off. You don't even know you get to work sometimes. You just get there. So you're not being observant and you're not trying to look for opportunities and things. Sometimes imageries come here and they see an opportunity that exists for everybody. There was a young guy in Auckland I saw in the newspaper yesterday and uh, he came with barely any language skills and he saw the opportunity to export product from New Zealand to China and he set up a company doing that. And because what he knew about his customers in China was they didn't trust Chinese-made products and, and so he imported milk formulas from New Zealand to China, something that Fonterra didn't really get. You know, they set up a factory in China. That wasn't what the Chinese wanted. It proved very fatal for them. Um, reality is, so he started exporting stuff, but then he realised that because he could speak Chinese, he could take product back the other way. So he just uh, circumvented Alibaba and brought in product himself, and you could buy it directly from him. So he saw an opportunity that was there for everybody to see. But the characteristics that we have that are different, we, we wrote a book about three years ago called The Power of Us. We tried to understand what made New Zealand as different on the world stage, and we are, we're completely different. We're arguably the most innovative country in the whole world. You know, we don't promote it and we don't even know it, but you are the most uh, creative country in the whole world. Um, and statistically, I could show you, show you that if we had time. But, um, but the, what makes us different is that we've got three rules that we operate to that are different than anybody else in the world. The first one is we're not following rules. And when I ask groups of people like this, who here has got a deck they haven't got a permit for or, or a window? <laughs> It's about a metre, that'll be fine. <laughs> don't worry about that, that's fine. Yep. We don't give a shit generally, you know. And just to, just to prove how that works, um, this is a true story about this 
I call my boys that work for me and the girls, my band of brothers, and they will walk through fight for me because we've got this family relationship. And uh, in Eritrea, at the end of the 30-year war of independence, the, um, the MiGs came over and, and mounted one of our warehouses, and it had all this high-tech ductwork in it for making this uh, medical device factory work for the Fred Hollows Foundation. So I didn't know what to do because... Um, it was going to take six months to get these guys back over land through the Sudan, fabricate the new stainless steel ductwork, get it back. If we had any aluminium in the whole country, we could have made some temporary ductwork and got the place going. But there was no aluminium in the whole country, so I didn't know what to do. And I don't recommend this for everybody, but it works for me. But when things really are munted and I don't know what to do, I, I usually just drink half a bottle of whiskey. Um, I find it takes the edge off. You, know. <laughs> you don't worry about things so much. Some people call it sleeping on it, but anyway. I slept on it. In the morning when I got up, uh, well, I heard the guys take off in the night with their utes and pop rivet guns. They just disappeared. And when I got up in the morning, I could hear all this grinding and sanding going on. I went down to the, the forecourt, and there was uh, the whole forecourt was covered in sheets of huge sheets of aluminium. And I knew there was no aluminium in the whole country because we tried to find some. And as I was walking across to see where they got this from, I could see that they were grinding off the motorway sign to Kerren. <laughs> the bastards have been out all night knocking off the whole motorway signs for the whole country because <laughs> Dad had a problem and they wanted to fix it. It was in Time magazine. They thought there was something to do with the invasion, but it wasn't. It was just a bunch of Kiwis that didn't give a shit, you know. <laughs> and that's what makes us different, you know. Whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, Ed Hillary, you know, his job was to put all these deployment of supplies going to the pole and wait for the poms to come along. He got so close, oh, fuck it, I'll just go and do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so close. <laughs> and that's what makes us different. Um, but the way that we, when you build those teams, this is a gift I can give you in terms of how do you build teams that really do have that trust and belief. Uh, it's, it's, and it, it, it takes time. You've got to have leadership skills that, and know what you want to do and take people on that journey. But one of the tools that we use is um, to evaluate you know, how you're performing. And, and um, my wife and I do this every night before we go to bed. Not what you're thinking, no. Uh, <laughs> what you do is you turn to that person and ask them for three adjectives to describe your performance as their boss or their per next person in their role that, for just that day. You don't have to define it or whatever. So when people are leaving my office, they'll hear them shout over their shoulder, inspirational, clever, thoughtful. But if they say inspirational, clever and complex, then the next morning I'll never chat to them because I want to understand where they are because we don't want to lose anybody in our team because they're all... We, you know, we're all one and we all act as one. And that breed, breeds these huge, profoundly powerful um, people who actually can change the world and do really complex things. So if you get those things right... So just thinking about all those things together, you need to have um, a customer statement of need that's for a real product that people want. And then to actually execute that business, you're going to need a, the right team of people around you. There's going to be a whole number of people with disparate skills because I'm hopeless at... Um, uh, I'm dyslexic, so I can't do mental arithmetic. So, um, you know, at school they said that uh, I was good at mental arithmetic as long as I could write it down, you know. Um, <laughs> but you find people who f fill the gaps that you don't have in your business. But then what you try and do then is to, to really focus on what the business is going to be like in three years and ten years' time. And that ten-year one is the one that you have to try and understand about. There are laws of innovation and adoption of innovation and basically what that says is that if you've got a new innovation only 10 percent of the population are going to be start you know first adopters okay and then there's a long kind of lag for and it's by word of mouth unfortunately it's not marketing uh, that, that, that drives these things it's actually people commonality saying this is okay this is okay to do this and then you've got the laggards that come in behind but if you understand that you can actually look at that failure mode cause risk analysis in your business and say I've got a great product and I've got a great team but will it actually be rolled out and what we have um, is embedded and unembedded systems embedded systems are ones that have got some regulation around them or some issues that may prevent you from distributing your product or, or marketing it. Unembedded ones are something that's what we call over-the-counter, where anybody can actually go and buy it. So I can make a mobile phone app, for instance, that I put a circle in the middle of my nose and it can measure the pixelation in the colour of the veins in my nose and tell me what my heart rate is. And I can just do that and send it out to everybody. I can charge you for you know, downloading the app. But if I do that in a hospital, it has to be 
FDA 510K approved. So when you start thinking about things like driverless cars, are you going to see driverless cars in 2050? Well, my algorithm analysis would say this, that probably not, not en masse, because we know, for instance, um, it's about us, about how we, how, we, how we accept technology. So, for instance, we know um, that um, the most difficult thing and, and risky thing in a, in a plane right now is the pilot, because they're bored and the last thing they have to do is land the plane and they get bored and tired. And if we got rid of them, it would actually be safer. But there's not one person in this room who's going to get on a plane with no pilot, is there? Because <laughs> you reboot, you know? No, it's not. But that's, that's, that, and that's, what, that's, that's the problem. So uh, do you think you're really going to get into a driverless car? What, what, if you think, and also then you think about the competitors, OK? Because you tend to be focused on your technology without thinking about what's happening outside that business that you're in. So if I looked at driverless cars, I'd say, well, what's a driverless car? And what, is it likely to be deployed? Well, it's probably likely to be deployed in things like where, the, where something's going in a straight line and you just get on and off this, so it would be a great transport thing to the airport or whatever. And uh, when I think about competitors, I think, well, haven't we got shuttles and that do that? And isn't a driverless car really a bus? You know, because um, when you think about the customer, what what benefits is that drive, driverless car going to add to the customer? And you have to distill all of that because I don't want to get in a driverless car with a whole bunch of other people. That's why I don't get on the buses. Um, so it's going to be my particular driverless car that needs to be delivered to me and, um, and I'll be allowed to go where I want to go, blah, blah, blah. But there's a whole lot of impediments to that being de deployed in terms of safety, uh, traffic um, lanes, where will they travel in the traffic lanes. Somebody's got to make a decision about that, the council. So these embedded systems take much longer to work out what is going to happen. And then the bigger ones are the ones that we always do. We, f we forget about all of the product completely and think about the big world. What's happening in the big world? Because we've got global warming, we've got all sorts of other things. What, what is going to happen in 2050? What's, what are the things that are going to influence us? Well, what I do know as a scientist that we've got um, rare earths, or about 23 rare earths, that make all the lithium-ion batteries and all the photon displays and all the computer chips in the world. And we're going to go from a petrol kind of diaspora to a rare earth diaspora. The most common supply is in China, which has got 98% of the world's economic supply, or about 23% purity. But the rest of the world's only got purities of about 3%. And again, it's an infinite supply. And they're not recyclable, unlike a lead-acid battery. So you've got a problem. So if you think that all these things are going to be deployed, there's going to be a big price crunch as well. So you have to think about that in the context of your business. So we do that. We do that. We're using batteries in our incubators. We're using batteries in our mobile phone device technologies. So we've actually costed out what we think that will look like if we had to double the price and can our customers stay with that. So you try and future-proof your business against what you know because... It, it it's, can be just one bit of legislation. And we know what happened with the taxi industry in New Zealand, for instance. People put their life savings into taxi licences, and then suddenly they were deregistered, and those, those things weren't worth anything. And then, of course, uh, people came along, like U uh, Uber, and again disrupted the business. So you try and think about all the other peripheral disruptions that may affect your business. People tend to think about being first to market as a salvation. It isn't, because... Innovation is so disruptive and it's logarithmic. You know, what's happening in our industries now is that you know, lighting that was uh, started in, in the cave lasted for millions of years. It's still, it, was, it certainly lasted three million years in common use as candles. We've still got candles. They just boiled animal fat, put it into a mould and off you went and you had light. But then what happened in the Industrial Revolution, we put gas lights into people's houses. That, that, was, that, was, that was a bad call. Um, but then finally they decided to use those same cables, to, uh, those same conduits, to put in electrical cables. And that meant you could have incandescent lights. And that lasted for probably about 50 years. And then you had about 15 years of um, halogen lights. And they only lasted 15 years before LEDs came along. And the same thing was in the music industry with the, you know, CDs and da-da-da. So you've got this exponential change. And you, so you've got to spend a bit of time looking at those algorithms with your business and say, is this really a relevant business that could carry on forever? Um, see, even companies like Trade Me now are advertising because their revenues are not as good as they were. And that's because other organisations are jumping over that. Alibaba, it's almost easier to get something from Alibaba and get it you know, by 
by post every day uh, than it is to go online and sort of argue with a whole lot of other people about what you might buy. So the world is changing constantly. Your trick is to try and understand the world at large in the relative ideology of your business. So there are some of the things that... Um, so, that, so just talking about those laws of innovation, the, the, the sounds like the primary one you talk about is, is finding a customer need and the customer statement of need is really key. And then working out whether that's, that need is going to exist in the future, that must be the hardest thing. And I know you, know, you talk about companies like Kodak, etc., who didn't well, it, quite... It, 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 yeah, it is and it isn't. I mean, um, we're all human, so we're our kind of um, physiology and we're actually... Slow, one of the most slowly evolving species on the planet, you know, um, in terms of how we're changing, in terms of um, uh, our physiology, for instance. Um, so we're not getting, uh, uh, we're getting older, you know, we're living longer, um, but it isn't an exponential change. So um, some of the things, we, we focus on healthcare simply because we know that that's going to be around forever. You know, it's an embedded system where we've got protections for our product because we have certain technological barriers that other people have to climb over as well. But in terms of, um, you know, thinking about um, our future, it's going to be predicated on um, what's happening to that bigger sphere of the world in terms of, I mean, if Trump gets into power, we all, we all might be looking at a nuclear, nuclear you know, holocaust, you know. Um, so... You, there are certain things that you can't predict, but what you can predict is that um, a good example would be um, this is a little experiment. You try this little experiment, understanding customer statement of need. Uh, one of the reasons I don't do PowerPoint is because people don't learn things from PowerPoint. They, they actually look at them and then they flick over. Them. But you, this, this little experiment will be fixed in your brain. So we're going to do something that's very customer centric. So. And this is how you, you make sure that you're absolutely ferociously customer-centric. So we're going to design um, a business card, OK? So together we're going to design a business card. So we're going to line two of them, OK? So if you think about one on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side, the one on the left-hand side, it's got it's A and Z. And on the top left-hand corner of that card, it's got A and Z. And in the middle, it's got Mr Smith, the name of the, the manager. And on the bottom right-hand side, it's got the tagline, which is the marketing line, which you want to get across, and it's, it's so it's just called It's Ours. So you read it, ANZ, manager, and then on the bottom right-hand side, it just says It's Ours, okay? Now what we're going to do with the other one is to flick it over completely the other way around. So it's a mirror image. So now on the other one, you've got uh, the ANZ on the top right-hand side, and on the bottom left-hand side, you've got It's Ours, okay? So we call the one on the left A, and the one on the right B, okay? Somebody's writing it down. <laughs> uh, and so, who likes A? Just show of hands, who likes A? Okay. Usually 98% of people are like A. Just simply because it's written from left to right, which is how you're taught to read. Okay? So you, you're pre-programmed to imbibe information in left to right ma matrices. You're also pre-programmed to like certain fonts and certain colours. And I know how much information you can absorb on a label um, before you get bored and start switching off. So we know a lot about you. We know where, where, how to put a landing place in a, in a supermarket and where, where the best shelves are. So by understanding everything about your customer, is, it doesn't change, you know, because you know what that customer is likely to like. Uh, the thing is, because um, most of the stuff that is above all of that is discretionary. So um, it's like we know that you, uh, that you, you know, people, if you have two... Um, teams playing against each other, one's got red jerseys on and one's got blue, the, the bias will always be in favour of the red team and the red jumpers. We're just pre-programmed to accept certain colours and certain things. So if you know everything about your customer, you've got a fair chance of understanding that customer statement of need. So getting that right is, is, is really the, the, the golden uh, grail. So we try and do that and then we try and future-proof it and say, well, where are things going? What will people accept in reality? Because Thinking about the technology, there's lots of technology. I can put an uh, induction charging rail right through this building, Velcro on lights, and use my mobile phone to switch those on and off. And that could be done tomorrow. All that technology exists. But because the, it's in an embedded industry, where there's a building industry, there's certain codes, and because the electrician wants to run 
two 40 volts cables and drop them down to 12 volt transformers for your lights. He wants to do that. So you've got to convince him to change and all of these other industries to change to adopt your technology. So the trick there is know your customers and develop an, a product that's in an unembedded system. Zero is a great, great example. Zero just made a product that was much more customer centric than any product that existed. UE, the um, uh, insurance company, all of their business is just predicated on one thing. It's about you. Why should you pay more insurance than that person over there? Because you don't take your car out hardly ever. So it's a very simple thing. So the people who actually, that's the future, is just being the ultimate customer centric company. And we've got a, a, a company we started called Visual Monitoring where um, we were monitoring babies in incubators and um, we were just doing it via a, a wrist, an ankle strap around their ankle, sending the data for heart rate and temperature to a mobile phone so that they didn't uh, die without anybody knowing. And we realised there's a bigger opportunity for that uh, company and so um, we made a product for St John's for their aged care um, market. So all these little old ladies, they thought they were going to faint, so they pushed their button and the ambulance driver would come and have a cup of tea with them and go away and that cost them about $50 million a year in spurious call-outs. So if they could mitigate that by knowing what was happening to that patient, then you could actually um, come up with a better solution. So we modified the technology. Now we've got a joint venture with Samsung watches. So 2017, you'll be able to buy a Samsung, uh, sorry, a Samsung 3G watch with a visual monitoring or, or Drupal app where you push it and it will um, send an ambulance to you wherever you are in the world. But also it's constantly monitoring your biometrics, sending them up to the cloud and sending your data back every day to tell you how you're going in trend analysis. Because what we know about things like Fitbit is that there's more Fitbits in people's drawers than there is anywhere else because you wear them for a while. So what you do is you make a product that actually communicates with the, the thing. And of course, what you can do with this, this technology that we've got is it means that if you've got a grandmother in America and you, or a grandfather in Hawke's Bay, you can go in and monitor and have a look at them. You may not be able to get them. So if your grand, grandfather's down in Hawke's Bay and you can't get hold of him, and you can actually see his heart rate. So when you finally get him and you can say, how are you? And he says, well, I was sleeping. So no, you weren't. I could see your heart rate. You were with Auntie Maud again. You know? <laughs> uh, so, 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 there's a privacy issue there. But, um, but that's the whole point about... Um, trying to think about the ultimate customer centric experience you know and that's why I don't use PowerPoint as well because when I say to people think about this if you were doing a PowerPoint presentation about the most intimate thing you could do with somebody like ask them out on a date or, or what you were going to do on a date you, if it was PowerPoint it'd be like slide one this is uh, the restaurant we're going to go to and then slide 11 might be this is what I hope we're going to be doing at 11 o'clock tonight you know <laughs> no, it's not going to work is it you know <laughs> it works much better in personal relationships you know so so think about your customer, because if, if you get nothing across, the other thing I want you to do is to dream really, really big. When I was living in rough under a railway bridge in London, um, I had um, you know, a, a dream to own my own bicycle shop because I was repairing bicycles from the tip and selling to my school chums. And now I head up an organisation that changes the lives of millions of people around the world. And none of that would have happened if I hadn't came to New Zealand because the three rules are that we're not fond of rules, that's the first one. The second one is we dare to dream. The, this is one of the few countries in the world where you can dare to dream and be anything that you want to be. There are no barriers at all. Anybody under the age of probably 40 who's reasonably easy on the eye in New Zealand who doesn't go around pulling people's hair could be Prime Minister. It's true, you know, because there are no barriers to whatever you want to dream to be. Okay? And the last one is um, we've got no... Um, we dare to dream. We dare to dream really, really big. There's no way in God's earth that the All Blacks should win on the world stage, you know, statistically it shouldn't happen because there's only a million of able-bodied men that can actually play rugby in New Zealand compared with about 180 million in Europe and we still win. But they win because they're a team, they've learned to work as a team so they have given up their personal identity for the, for the, for the whole entity. So instead of making a dive for the line and, and getting their own bit of glory, they pass at the right moment to actually score that try. They don't let their jumpers go onto the floor and they believe in each other and they trust in each other. What makes me proud, of course, when we won the World Cup uh, was when we won it against the Australian. My wife's Greek Australian, she loved that. Um, and uh, was when they blew that final whistle, I knew that that whistle was also invented by Kiwi. Right now, right now, there are billions and billions of people all around the world using Kiwi technology. But mostly, we don't teach our kids about that, and we should because that will make them feel much more inspirational. So a good example about daring to dream 
Who's Bill Buckley? Who's that Bill Buckley? Okay, pretty much nobody. I've got to work up a small percentage. If you've got a mobile phone, you've been touched by Bill Buckley. His company in South Auckland makes 90% of the electromagnets that fire up all of the mobile phone photon displays or TV displays in the world. It isn't a company in Silicon Valley. It's a, it's a guy in South Auckland, and he's, uh, or he wears an Einstein tie and he drives his... Um, uh, Aston Martin. Well, he doesn't. His wife drives it because he's got too many speeding tickets. Go to, go to one, not fond of rules, you know. So he said to the guy, I can control the car at 230 miles an hour, officer. Um, but anyway, uh, but, but he, he's a renegade and he just did it. Um, who's heard of Colin Murdoch? Colin Murdoch? Anybody? No. Nobody. Everybody in this room has been touched by Colin Murdoch. He was a guy, uh, a pharmacist from Timaru, who had that one moment of observation. His big pen stopped working, so he got a matchstick, pushed it down to get that last little bit of ink out. And when he was doing that, he thought, shit. He went into the garage, fired up the lathe, and made the world's first disposable plastic hypodermic syringe, which revolutionised global health care. Before that, we were all using glass syringes. In fact, in 1953, when he was inventing this, um, I was in a school in, in, uh, in East London, lined up in alphabetical order, all getting our BCG jabs. And in those days, it was a, a glass syringe, but also the same needle. We didn't even know about AIDS in those days. We were just all lined up. I was bloody glad my name was Avery, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Got two daughters, Amelia and Anastasia. <laughs> These things stay with you. But the point is that, that he changed the world. He literally changed the world in terms of global distribution of global health care. And so that was one Kiwi. Uh, what do you think about better workshops and the technology that's deployed in every movie that you see that's got animation on it? And so when you actually look at all of these things, we lead the world in induction charging. Um, we, we, uh, when you think about our inventiveness, um, we, it's not even just limited to um, technology, but we kill more tourists per head of population than anybody else because of the Zorb and um, bungee jumping and all these sort of things. You know. We're creatively destructive. And that's why I love New Zealand, because you can do anything that you like and be anything that you like. And what you really need to do, though, is start a new generation of kids that start to think about being innovative you know, and start to think about being creative. I mean, I don't want my kids to um, be predicated on an industrial revolution education thing. So when they come home, I show them stuff. I don't want them to be a scientist, but I want them to understand everything that works. You know, the other day I bought a $29.95 rocket to show them how rockets work. You know, and you put um, sodium bicarbonate and vinegar in it and you shake it up and you go, Phew, you know. And I put that all in and shook it up and you went, Phew. <laughs> Premature ejaculation, that was just rubbish. Um, so, I, so I said to the girls, I'll make you a rocket. And I've got a 44 gallon, gallon drum. <laughs> put in 25 kg of citric acid and some, some sodium bicarbonate. Got me old Ryobi drill, uh, battery drill, put that in there. And I aerodited the rocket on the top because I just wanted it to have enough pressure to sort of go off over the neighbour's fence. We wrote the name of the man on the moon on the side because we knew it was going. The kids were up against the house with their goggles on, their, their, their swimming goggles, you know. And I, and I, and I started the... The, uh, the, the drill and the bloody thing exploded. And uh, <laughs> I was just covered in a sea of foam. The house was covered in foam. The kids were covered in foam. Mum came out and she said, what's going on? And I looked at the kids and I said, you guys OK? And they said, that's brilliant. Dad, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> because kids don't have any... They're naturally innovative. Kids are naturally innovative. We've had that you know, taken out of us. But the people who get over that and say, let's just be naughty and innovative and play with stuff and... If we do it together, we've got a great chance. I think New Zealand's in a, in a very good space to, to actually um, become the Silicon Valley of, um, of, the, of the Asia Pacific region. There's so much technology. Peter Beck's another good example. Who's that, Peter Beck? Peter Beck? Okay. Peter Beck's a guy who did make the rockets and put them on his bike. And he went down to Iraqi Gulf and put a rocket up into the at atmosphere um, with some funny Michael Fay. <laughs> Can't do that in any other country in the world. You get locked up. No private individual. They didn't, he didn't have a permit for it. The first two, two times they did it, they didn't have any permits. They just did it. <laughs> it was on Maori land. They're OK. <laughs> and, but you see, that's that first rule, not fond of rules. So he gave it a go. And then he managed... Stephen Tinder was walking past his lab um, after Lanzatech. Anybody know about Lanzatech? Lanzatech are changing the world in terms of taking, using bacteria to eat up uh, the effluents from um, big... Um, steel mills in China. So it's a huge multi-million dollar business. So we invented that technology in New Zealand. And so same thing with Peter Beck. So Peter Beck's now got a way of, he's made a 3D printed rocket pretty much engine called, um, uh, anyway, the Rutherford rocket. And basically he can put a rocket and deploy a satellite um, for 
um, communication for about a, about nearly a hundredth the price of what it would take a normal rocket to do it, and it's a recyclable rocket. So you just rethought everything. And so Rocket Lab now, you may surprise you to know we've got more rocket scientists per head of population than any other country in the world right now. But everybody should know about this, and everybody should take great glee in the fact that our innovation index on the world stage is about number 15 behind Switzerland. So Switzerland's number one in terms of innovation. The problem is that innovation, the way that it's measured is how many products you get to market and how many patents you've got. And the Swiss have got 2,875 patents for just one watch uh, movement. So that's where it gets skewed. They may invent stuff, but it's not prime stuff that actually is game-changing technology. And arguably, Richard Pierce was the first person to fly a plane. Went down to the pub and said, made a plane. <laughs> Somebody said, what's a plane? He said, well, it's a thing that flies, it's lighter than the air, you know. Because nobody knew about planes. Crashed it into the hedge. About six months later, at Kelly Hawk, the Wright brothers were there. They had Oprah, CNN, Campbell Live. They told people. And that's the difference. We've got to start changing and start having some self-pride. You know, I'm ferociously proud to be a Kiwi because we change the world. Because every day, our technology is being used to make the world a better place. And so we need to start generating that. And that also that fearlessness. There's a whole lot of people like you in garages all over New Zealand you know, most of the innovation that we, comes out of New Zealand comes out of companies that have got less than 50 people. So it isn't big multinational companies anymore. In fact, uh, all the big multinational companies now wait until they get a startup company that's done the hard yards in terms of getting proof of concept, and then they buy that company at a good price and so on. So that's maybe part of your exit strategy if you think about that business. So if nothing else today, I hope that you... Um, that you know that you can change the world. There's nobody in this room who can... who can't change the world if they have a dream but you need to talk to each other, look after each other and hopefully uh, lastly I think you need to think about having products that are good for us and our society because that goes back to that big big problem that we have that you know, we're eating all the resources that we have around us um, and we don't think about sustainability generally in the things that we do mm. you know we're we focus on healthcare because it seems to be a safe and moral thing to look after the sick and the halt and the lane and make global changes. And um, um, I've, with the 5,000 days that I've got left, um, that's certainly what I'm going to be doing. Fantastic. I've got a question which relates to that. How do you balance creating novel and useful products and, and making money, particularly with social aims and, and making the world a better place? Well, it's a good question because... Um, where we got lost in is that um, when we started to work together as groups, um, you know, the original concept for um, third party involvement was that people who were agriculturally based um, couldn't get all their crops in themselves because they needed to get more staff in and then you had to have uh, toilet facilities and then you had to have local governments to actually form um, structures to manage all of the infrastructure. So we've got these fragmented bits of it, our lives where government runs a lot of stuff for us because originally we couldn't run it for ourselves. And now they're a law unto themselves, so you've got those kind of things going on. But also in business you've got um, uh, a society that the products that we have are culturally driven, if you think about it. You know, um, there's some things that we wouldn't do in New Zealand, I don't think we'd be able to set up a factory for building landmines, for instance, on the, on, on the predication that it saves lives. That's what happens in America. Um, so what we tend to do is to, to try and make things that we think um, are good for us generally, but we don't often think it through the whole way. Um, so right now, I mean, companies like the Warehouse Group, they probably import more plastic stuff that we don't really need, but we like cool stuff sometimes. We like to play with but it's nice to have this cool stuff that we can play with or give something to our kids to play with. But we don't really think when we buy a product about um, how it's going to impact on our, on, our, uh, on our world. The reality is that it will, ultimately, and it will on, on our children. So what we need to do is to start thinking about that um, in everything that we do. And I think you can, because I think we're moving into a, uh, another phase of our human evolution where it's good to be good, you know, it used to be 
good to be in tobacco. If you watch any 1950 um, coming home for, to cook a, a nice meal, there was, mum was had a fag on the go while she was cooking the chook, and we used to think that was all, all, all OK. So we've changed that. We stopped smoking on planes, which was, you know, we, that's no, smoking an unsex sex on a plane. You know, we invented that. That was complete madness, like pissing in a swimming pool. You know, it doesn't affect the other end. Anyway, <laughs> but, the, but the point is that... Um, we, we've got better at thinking about us and in, in things like, you know, think about all the health and safety stuff that's come in just recently. So, we, we, so, so the, you, there's a good example. Um, health and safety stuff, which is good for us, there's a whole business now that's developed around that. But I think companies like Google um, and certainly people who make a lot of money tend to, at some point, um, try and um, develop some social enterprise around that or have their own charity associated with it, like the Gates Foundation. What I think is, is a smarter model is to build that into your business day one. So um, if you can find a way of connecting your product with something that's got, that, you know, you know, I think social enterprises are the ultimate um, uh, business to be involved in. But there's obviously less opportunities for social enterprises when most of the machinery that we use, certainly with things like accounting, are service industries. But all that's changing too. So think about, you know, there are not going to be any banks in 2050 not any physical locations. There might be one or two centres that are specialist centres for doing things, but banking won't be there. There'll be a whole lot of other things that, um, you know, petrol sales are declining um, because of um, the internet, because you don't have to go out. You can get your countdown shopping delivered to you, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, will technologies like drones, is the, is the sky going to be filled with drones, um, with, you know, carrying... Um, parts for your, uh, your car, you know, exhaust, sea exhaust going through the air, or um, probably not because of these embedded, embedded things. It's going to be a very slow uptake of stuff. So your trick is to try and understand, you know, what's going to happen in the future. Um, but somebody's got to drive these things like, um, uh, you know, it's, you know, being more public about uh, developing companies that are good because customers do do that. In fact, um, all the people that work for us are professional people who are at the top of their game and they donate their time for free to work for us to get products like our low-cost infant incubator. The guy that worked, um, that did all our power supply, he, he worked for uh, Elon Musk. He was their senior designer for their battery systems and he sold out because he didn't like the direction the company was going in and went back to uh, live in Melbourne and he phoned me up one day and said, look, I know you're making a low-cost infant incubator. How would you like a battery that will last 15 years and cost $250 and have a backup power supply for 10 hours? And I said, well, that's impossible. And he said, well, I'll do it for you for nothing. And he spent two years doing it. And he got to use his skills to make a difference in the world. And that's the best that you can have, is just to actually use your skills to actually do something that's good for us and our planet. That's what I do when I get up every day. Uh, and I try and encourage everybody to... Um, to do that because it's the most rewarding thing that you can do. You know, there's nothing worse than being a used to be. Um, that getting the end of your career and, and you used to be the head uh, honcho at the ANZ Bank. Because usually what those people do is they start another career that they really wanted to do. <laughs> you know, they start a vineyard or something. So that's the last thing is do something you love. Do something you love because most people don't love what they do. You know, they, they actually went into it through that school education system, through the careers advice, and suddenly found themselves in that job. And you know, they don't necessarily love it. They, and so it's not too late uh, to find something that you do that you love. But the opportunities out there are phenomenal in this. And the good thing is that, it, that you, people tend to think that it's a bit like somebody who wrote um, about patents in 1953. Somebody wrote most of the patents that have ever been written have been written. But they couldn't foresee the future in terms of um, computers and digital technology. So it's the most, in terms of knowledge, which is what you need to start a, a business and understand being customer centric, the opportunities now are so phenomenal because you've got the internet and you can become an expert in anything in a few minutes just by going online and finding out and testing things. So rather than it being um, um, a preventative process, you've got a huge opportunity to do things. And I'm just excited by what we might be able to do, you know, as a society. And New Zealand, because of the way that we are, we've only got 17 people per square kilometre compared with somebody like Switzerland, which has got 350 people per square kilometre. But what happens with us is we talk to each other. You know, innovation always occurs at the edge of societies. And we are at the edge of society. And I call it the penguin syndrome. If you've got a bunch of penguins all together and they're really compressed, in the middle of that group, there's two penguins talking to each other, and they go like this. 
How's your day? Oh, I mean, my egg moved. Yeah, what did you do? Well, I just, uh, oh, this guy keeps pushing me from behind, but my egg's all right, you know. And nothing's happening in the middle of that penguin. At the edge of that penguin colony, these guys are swimming around and they're waving their fins at guys over the other side of the colony. And one of them might slip in a, in a streak of poo and go sli sliding down ten times faster than ever happens before. And he invents ship luging. And that's where innovation... <laughs> That's where innovation occurs, always by that power of observation and those people talking to each other at the edge of society. And we are that, we are that. New Zealand is that. And that's why on world stage we are the most innovative country in the world. Fantastic. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Are there any questions from the floor that anyone would like to ask before we finish up? Yeah. You know the big data phenomenon and our ability now to mine uh, data in a sort of almost infinitely fast way compared to previously. Um, there are some experts in the world who are predicting that in about five to ten years uh, the vast majority of the population will be out of work. I mean we already have Watson um, diagnosing patients uh, in the absence of any medical personnel. Uh, more accurately than humans would do. Uh, what are your views on that? Can I, can I just repeat that question? Yeah. People at home. So the question is, how is big data and technological advancement going to affect um, the employment of millions of people? Is that, is that what you're saying with the example of Watson and the, and the medical diagnosis? Yep, great, thank you. Yeah, um, no, it's a good question, and, and so it goes back into that, um, that, that algorithm analysis of how you try and um, work out what might happen in the future. And um, it, what, what I can say absolutely is it'll be slower than what everybody predicts simply because of those embedded systems. And, and um, um, it goes back to, um, if, if you take the, the, the laws of robotics, you know, um, uh, the Asimov's laws of robotics, supposing you have, uh, if we go to the ultimate prescri prescription where you've got a robot that does jobs, you know, I mean, you've got robots now that pretty make, much make cars. But having a robot that will do your job with artificial intelligence creates a whole lot of other problems. And, you know, like the laws of robotics say that robots can't hurt their, their caregivers, the people looking after the humans. But that gets very, very complicated when you start, or a robot driving a car, um, how does he choose which, um, which person whose life to save in a particular situation? So there are a whole lot of complex things that come into play when you start thinking about that, that future and what we do when that when it gets too complicated is we do absolutely nothing so we don't adopt that technology because it's too unknown and too too risky so I don't think we're going to see quite the what we what we love to do is um, think about this fantastic future and and you know Ian Musk wants to take everybody on a joy road to Mars you know uh, there's a whole lot of complicated things that need to be done to to make all of that stuff work you think about the space race and how little has evolved since we first put people on the moon in terms of have we have shuttles up to the moon every week you know there's been a whole lot of rockets that have blown up on the on the forecourt recently um, so we are always working ahead of there's a big difference between um, the um, implementation sorry the uh, the r and d of technology and its implementation as a, a in a common usage way so um, I'm not really fearful. Uh, somebody said the other day that their six-year-old daughter would never know how to drive a car. And I don't think that statement's true from what I know about the rate of innovation, the rate of innovation of change. Um, it's taken as many, many years um, to get robots to be used in a surgical situation in a, in a hospital. And even that's in a very controlled way, you know, um, in terms of um, what they actually do. So, so I'm not fearful that um, we're all suddenly going to be overwhelmed by um, that. That being said, um, if we have a change in something like nanotechnology, which just changes the whole way that digital stuff can work, that would be the next revolution. And that's unimaginable because that's what happens with really truly destructive technology. You don't see it coming. You don't see that that would happen. Um, I mean, at the time that Apple launched their first real computer, they, weren't in, they didn't actually have a customer for the ultimate customer because the internet didn't exist at that time. They were making computers for retail people. They actually made their first computers just for, to, so that retail people could do their books online and do them better. 
But at that stage, the internet didn't exist. And the internet was one of those things that nobody could foresee. No, your grandmother couldn't foresee. Um, but now, what's happening now is, of course, uh, grandmother would have thought that getting money out of a hole in a wall was really exciting. You know, this is really space age stuff. But of course, that's not going to happen anymore. And in fact, probably something like money will be is more likely to be gone than than your job. It's all of that processing stuff that will be attenuated about us because it just makes more sense not to have to carry lots of money in your wallet if you've got. Um, now that this, um, you know, I've got a watch and my daughter says that's old school. What do you need a watch? And she said, it's a single unit device. It only does one thing. I said, well, it's got date on it. <laughs> <laughs> but she's, she's brought up in that digital age. And I look at her on a computer and, and I think it's brilliant. She came to me the other day and she had taken a picture of a, a cockroach and then by some trickery with the, the thing, she showed it to me and moved her phone and the, and the cockroach was running around the inside of the screen. And she programmed that all herself. She's about eight years old and no idea how she did it. Um, and she fixes the computer for me now. Um, so that's the brave new world. And, but what she's got that most of the kids her age don't have because she lives with me is a great imagination. And she will be the one that comes up with that next idea for doing the next thing or the next thing. Um, but the person that goes through the normal education system is going to think in a very linear way. So our future is not linear. In fact, our brain is actually processed um, and hardwired in the, the way that your brain is to work, to work in a very linear way. We're not designed to work in a logarithmic way. So that's going to be the big challenge for us. And that's why we're the gatekeeper of that technology. Because if you get something that's too way out and too, too bizarre, we won't adopt it. You know, our brain's incapable of saying we're going to adopt that and actually start deploying it. So, so I'm not fearful for the future. In fact, I think the next uh, 25 to 30 years is going to be really exciting for us because I think it's going to be um, us using technology for the benefit of us. And we've just right. got to focus on that. Right. Fantastic. Well, I've certainly found this about the most inspiring hour that I can remember spending. I hope you guys have, um, have found the same. I'm sure you have. Uh, I'm already starting to kind of work out how many thousand hours I've got left, which is a little bit of a, sca <laughs> a scary thought. But, um, but yeah, thank you very much, Sir Ray, one of um, New Zealand's truly uh, great New Zealanders and great innovators. We really appreciate your time. Please join me in thanking Sir Ray. So guys, I'd just like to also thank, um, thank Spark very much and Spark Labs, and, and please use your uh, mobile site to provide uh, us with feedback, whether you enjoyed the session and, and what more you'd like to get out of it, and to connect with each other. Um, and uh, you can, of course, um, watch this talk again, which I'm going to on, uh, um, on Facebook and the social media things uh, for Spark Labs. So thanks again for your time, and, and feel free to, to have a coffee and a, and a juice and, and make some more connections. Thanks again. Oh.